Luke Armstrong is always in search of a new adventure. He's 31, he's a travel writer, and the thing he loves to write about most is a little-known, undiscovered corner of the world. In the spring of last year, Luke was sitting on the sidewalk in front of a 7-Eleven in Bangkok. He was drinking a beer and just watching the traffic go by when a new adventure walked right up and sat down next to him. This guy sat next to me who called himself Akbar. I think he was a jewel smuggler because I would ask him, like, well, what do you do? And he would say, oh, I'm a trader of many things. And he'd talk about, like, getting things over the Burmese border. Import, export. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And he told me about this temple called Wat Klaiganwan, which I guess is Thai for um, temple, no worries. Um, it's like the Akuna Matata of Thai. So, of course, there are tons of temples in Thailand tourists can visit. But this temple, Temple Wat Klai Gon Wan, Akbar told Luke that it was totally undiscovered by tourists. Beautiful, serene, tucked away, hard to find. It sounded like a challenge. Luke doesn't speak Thai, so he wrote down the phonetic spelling of the temple in English. And immediately he started asking everyone in his circle of expats and backpackers if they knew about this mysterious place. And everyone he talked to said, nope. Some of his friends told him it must be fake, because if it were real, they were sure they would have already known about it. Luke tried guidebooks, he tried Googling, but he didn't even know if the name he'd written down was lost in translation. And I was getting absolutely nothing. So you wanted to go meditate in this temple, but there was also sort of like this Indiana Jones feeling you were having, like, I'm going to find this lost temple that nobody believes is real? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> like, Indiana Jones has been a huge um, <laughs> influence in my life. Um, <laughs> so I turned to Tinder. I'm Jane Marie, and this is DTR, a branded podcast from Tinder and Gimlet Creative about defining the relationship in the digital age. Today, we're bringing you two very different stories about the crazy, amazing things that can happen when you get off your phone and get into the real world. Because at its most basic level, Tinder is about connecting people. And those connections can lead to some very unexpected places. Luke really needed a new connection. He wasn't getting anywhere in his search for this mysterious temple Wat Klai Gon Wan. He needed to find someone who spoke both English and Thai and who knew about it. It dawned on Luke that the easiest way to do that might be Tinder, because on Tinder he had access to so many people. Some of them might speak both languages and be willing to help him. So he opened up Tinder and started swiping right, sending every single person he matched with the exact same hapless opening line. Hi, I'm a travel writer from America, and I'm trying to find this temple Wat Klai Gon Wan. Um, do you have any information about it? And lo and behold, this woman, May, knew about it. Luke matched on Tinder with a Thai woman named May. And May not only spoke English and Thai, but she had actually heard of the temple. It wasn't a love match or anything, but she was totally willing to help him out. May messaged Luke with some very valuable pieces of information. First, in English, she told him the name of the bus to catch to get on his way to the temple. And then she gave him the real key. In their messages on Tinder, May wrote the name of the temple and the city closest to it in Thai characters. She typed it all out so Luke could just hold his phone up and show the messages to people to get help along the way. So I have this screenshot from May on Tinder in Bangkok, and I know what bus I'm to leave Bangkok on mm -hmm. and what bus station. And so I have that much information, and the next morning I set out to the bus station. So I'm, I'm obviously a tourist, so I'm just, like, sitting there smiling. And I, other than saying, like, hello, thank you, where is the bathroom, all I can do is point to this screenshot of the Thai characters May has given me, which I don't really know what they mean. You know, as far as I know, she's written, this guy is an idiot, and I will not go on a date with him. <laughs> <laughs> Using the screenshots to get help every step of the way, Luke pieced together his path to the temple in broken English, gestures, sign language. So it would have been, I guess, the man calling himself Akbar. Then that led to Tinder, which led to May. 
which led to that bus. And every person he showed the screenshots to brought him one step closer. People at another bus stop, which led to another bus, which led me to Hanka, which led me to a lady selling food on the street who spoke a little bit of English, which led me to... 24 hours and a dozen bus, friendly strangers later, early the next morning, Luke arrived at the steps of the very real Temple Wat Klaigon Wan. Which led me to Op, the man who picked me up in the SUV, which led me to the monastery. And it turned out, Akbar was right about everything. It was a glistening gilded temple, remote and undiscovered by tourists. For all the traveling Luke had done, it was unlike anywhere he had ever been before. And suddenly I'm out at 6 a.m., a foreigner, no one's asking questions, and the sun's rising and the birds are singing and the insects are humming and the air is fresh and felt new. And just like the full stop and to be like, you're here right now. Like This is what you're doing right now. Sometimes new connections lead you to remarkable, extraordinary places. And sometimes they lead you to remarkable and extraordinary people. That is what this next story is about. What made you get on Tinder in the first place? Probably just like anybody else, I, you know, was probably bored. And um, it was just something different to do and to try it out. I got tired of my social circle and was ready to meet some new people out there. This is Jennifer Thomas. She lives in Tampa, and she was swiping through Tinder one day and decided to swipe right on a guy named Rich O'Day. Yeah, I actually matched with Rich a couple of times. And one of the times, we exchanged phone numbers, we texted. He sent me pictures of his labradoodles or golden doodles, his dogs, oh, and cute. all kinds of things. So we started talking again and planned our actual date. And where did you guys meet? Actually, our first date was at Amelie Arena. We went to the Imagine Dragons concert. A concert sounds like a fun first date. You know what? It really was, because nobody really takes you to a concert on your first date. <laughs> I met her outside of the stadium where the concert was. That's Rich. And her personality was very vibrant and dynamic. Very easy to talk to right away. We just started talking right away because he walked up and I had a beer for him as soon as he got there. So Jennifer and Rich are sitting in these balcony seats waiting for the show to start. They got a couple of beers and they're making the small talk that we all do on first dates. What do you do for a living? Where are you from? Do you have any secret kids? Are you still sleeping with your baby dad? You know, that kind of stuff. And a first date hot topic in Tampa is workouts, of course. Rich is in really good shape. And I know it's kind of hypocritical of me. And I, I think that guys are great when they're in shape and they take care of themselves. But I don't like to work out. And last summer, I was going through a phase where I refused to work out. And I told him, <laughs> I said, you know, you look amazing. I want you to know up front that I don't work out. So if that's a deal breaker, I just want you to know. And he was like, no, it's not a deal breaker. That's fine. But then I started asking, you know, what do you do to work out? I'm curious. And he told me about how he was training for a marathon for uh, the New York City Marathon, actually. For some people who don't like to work out, hearing that their first date is a marathon runner might be a turn on. But for Jennifer and me, it was like, gross, why would anyone ever do that? But then Rich explained. I had mentioned to her that I'm on a team, uh, a marathon charity team for the PKD Foundation that we formed here in Tampa. We were training for the 2015 New York Marathon, and I was kind of explaining what we do. And my buddy Scott, who's the captain of our team, uh, his wife was sick with PKD. PKD is polycystic kidney disease. If you've never heard of it, it's a life-threatening genetic disease that causes cysts to grow in the kidney. And those cysts cause kidney function to gradually decrease to the point of kidney failure. I had no idea what it was. I had never known anybody who had kidney failure at all or any sort of uh, issue like that. I, I've never known anything about it. So Rich's friend's wife, the person suffering from PKD, her name is Erica. She's a mom of two kids, ages 13 and 15. PKD's symptoms commonly start to appear midlife. In some cases, it can barely affect you at all, or it can turn your kidneys into a slowly ticking time bomb. Lots of people with PKD end up needing a kidney transplant. When Rich and Jennifer went on the first date, Erica had a matter of months before her kidneys gave out. 
there's no cure for PKD at the moment, and there's very little treatment for it. So we were trying to just do something opposed to just sitting back and letting the disease progress. She'd had a lot of friends and family attempt to donate, but they had been um, disqualified from donating for different reasons. It had become pretty critical that her health was declining, and they were at a time where it was really important that they found a donor. Instantly, she jumped in and she's like, well, you know, what can I do to help? He said, well, first of all, they have to be, you know, a match with the blood type. And I asked, um, well, I'm O positive. Are O positive and O negative compatible? And he said, I honestly don't know. So we kind of left it there. I said, let me know, you know, find out, let me know and I'll get tested. And he said, okay, are you serious? And I said, yeah. And he said, okay. This is not normal first date small talk, right? These two were total strangers like an hour ago. I mean, at this point, we're barely into the beginning of the concert. One plastic cup of beer into it. Was this during the concert? Yeah, this is while we were waiting for it to start, I believe. <laughs> so you had met him like 10 minutes earlier and then you're <laughs> suddenly like, let me get tested to give your friend a kidney. Right, we were in the first 45 minutes of meeting. Did you worry that maybe you were coming on a little strong? <laughs> no, because you know it, it had nothing to do with him. No, I know. I know. So, That's so, so, so have, has this ever come up for you before? No. No. Yeah, wow. No, I mean, it never occurred to me. I'm kind of the I just kind of float through life and things are presented to me and I say yes to as much as I can. So so how'd the rest of the date go? The rest of the date was fun. We had a really great time. But was it a love match? You know, we really didn't have the opportunity to find out. We made plans for a second date, but in between date one and date two, my ex-boyfriend popped up and because, you know, they have that radar thing when you move on and, you know, oh, you're they can doing smell good. it from miles away. It's like blood in yeah. the water. They're sharks. So then they come out of the woodwork and they want to get back together. In the couple of days after that first date, Jennifer actually ended up getting back together with the ex-boyfriend. She called Rich to tell him that they wouldn't be going out on another date. She also made one more call to Tampa General Hospital to make an appointment to get tested and see if she'd be a potential kidney donor match for Erica. So they basically said, come on down and see us and we'll, we'll draw your blood and we'll see if you're a match. So they do a blood and tissue sample. Uh -huh. And that was the first step. I did that and um, they called me a few days later and said, well, you're a match. I was really excited. Like, I, I think I might have cried. Yeah? Like, I was so thrilled. Just because I had been, you know, talking about this with my friends and family and coworkers about how excited I was to possibly be able to do this for somebody. This was the critical first hurdle for Jennifer and Erica. Their blood types were compatible, but this was just step one of a dozen steps. There was a lot more testing to do. Then they kind of told me, you know, slow down because there's a lot more testing that you have to do before we can actually approve you to donate. I kept saying, you know, because it's a long process. It's not, okay, we're a match and overnight you're going to have surgery. This is Erica Bragan. And as careful as Jennifer was being about how many tests there were, Erica had been through this with a handful of other donors who fell through for one reason or another. She knew exactly how long the process is and how fragile it is. They have to go through a bunch of different testings. And I kept saying every time, I said, she's going to back out. I mean, I had to go and have my blood drawn several times. And every time they took eight or nine vials. I mean, it was a lot. And then, oh, yes. and then I had to do a 24-hour urinalysis. And they got weird results the first time. So they asked me to do it again. Uh-huh. And so I did my 24-hour urinalysis again, and this time the lab <laughs> gave me the wrong size container, so I didn't get the whole 24 hours in there, and the results were screwed up again. So I had to do it a third time, oh, great. which is difficult because you literally carry a jug around with you for 24 hours, and every time you pee, you have to collect it in this jug. <laughs> so the, the first two times, I did it on a weekend, Yeah. and the third time... I wanted to get it over with, and I asked my employer, can I work from home, please? Because my job, I could easily do 
from home. And they said, no, you may not. Oh, wow. Right. So they didn't want to make it easy on me. Mm. So I brought the jug to work. And I made it as... <laughs> just un- set it on your desk. Yeah. At, well, I put it in the break room refrigerator on top of somebody's pizza. <laughs> so <laughs> I just made it as uncomfortable as possible, you know. Amazing. So... Uh, For all of Jennifer's excitement and resolve to help, Erica was terrified. She was getting closer and closer to a potential match, someone who could maybe save her life. And yet, she didn't want to get her hopes up. I mean, she had to do one test three times, and I was like, she's going to give up and just say, this is too frustrating, you know. (laughs) I'm sorry, but I can't do it. Did you ever have any second thoughts? No. Never? Not at all. I couldn't believe, uh, you know, a complete stranger would come out of the blue and say, I'm ready to be tested and then and then be a match. And, you know, I'd gone through about four or five individuals who did not end up being a match that I thought it probably wasn't going to happen. So I think I always kept that in the back of my mind till they said, OK, she's agreed where we have a date. <laughs> And I was that, like, that's when you finally were convinced when you had a surgery date? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jennifer didn't back out. She went through the dozens of tests, and she passed every single one. She gave blood, she carried the pee jug, and they kept moving forward. Jennifer excitedly, and Erica skeptically, toward that surgery date. By the way, organ donation between two total strangers? That basically never happens. It's really rare to see an altruistic donor who's a stranger. We're talking numbers like maybe one in 50,000. Very, very rare. This is Art Kaplan. He's the director of the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU's School of Medicine. Most people don't want to do it. Uh, You know, you go to them, so would you give a kidney to an absolute stranger or somebody you met once? And they're sort of like, "Mm, I don't think so. Back in the 90s, Professor Kaplan helped develop the ethical rules that are frequently used to govern living organ donations. He says, not surprisingly, that family members are the most common living donors. The overwhelming majority of those people are family members who are related by blood because that becomes somewhat important in matching the donor and the recipient to making it work, that you be biologically similar. Altruistic kidney donation is so uncommon and the procedure is so invasive that when you're the donor, it can be really hard for the people who love you to understand why in the world you want to do it. That's what happened with Jennifer's best friend, Gina Wentworth. She said, um, (laughs) she said, I went on a date with this guy and a friend of his um, wife needs a kidney and I'm going to get tested. And I said, nope. (laughs) No, you're not. (laughs) My main concern was that she is a single mother. So I was just, you know, just worried about losing my friend and, and worried about her son. But Gina finally got why Jennifer wanted to go through with this when she met Erica and her family. What helped change my mind is Erica has children. Um, She's around my age, and we have children around the same age. And that, it just kind of put a whole new spin on it for me. And I just kind of started to come around. Then I did a little bit more research and looked at the recoveries, looked at the success rates, looked at the survival rates. I then started to kind of come around. Then it just became a big, um, you know, of course you have to do this. Even though I would be scared too, I don't know if I could do it. Thank God there's people like you that exist that can do it, and now I fully support you. By the time the surgery date came, that ex-boyfriend, the one who popped up right after Rich and Jennifer's first date, was out of the picture. So in the pre-dawn hours on the morning of surgery, Rich drove 45 minutes to pick Jennifer up and drive her to the hospital. She told me that she was going to Uber to the hospital. 
that morning. She had to be there, I believe, at 5, 5.30 in the morning. Uh-huh. And I'm like, no, you're not Ubering to the hospital. No, <laughs> that's not happening. I will pick you up. I drove and I picked her and her son up. And I, I tell you, I was more nervous than Jen was. Uh-huh. I mean, she was bubbly personality, happy. She was in a good spirits. He picked me up and brought me. So he was my person because I didn't have anybody else. Rich was nervous. Erica was nervous. Erica's family was nervous. Jennifer, though, not nervous at all. Here's Erica. You know, she just was amazing. We would go in to see her before she went in, and she's just like, I'm like, are you nervous? She's like, nope. Nope, everything's going to be fine. It's all going to be good. I mean, they made it sound like it was going to be horrible. And it it wasn't, you know, a walk in the park, but it was much better than I had anticipated. You know, I definitely woke up feeling like I got hit by a truck. And Erica woke up feeling much better mm-hmm. because she felt terrible before. <laughs> by Sunday, I was in a little scooter at the mall buying a Christmas tree at Z Gallery. So, I mean, you know, it couldn't have been that bad. And a week later, Rich and I went to a hockey game. This is a good advertisement for kidney donation. Right? <laughs> um. <laughs> Erica just passed the one-year mark for her transplant without any complications. Awesome. She says she feels really good these days, and she has a lot more energy. Her goal is to get into beach volleyball shape so she can play with her daughter. So, a right swipe. That led to a first date, which led to small talk, which led to a real conversation, which led to Jennifer doing something extraordinary, something no one, including her, ever thought she would do save someone else's life. Where would Erica be without without this, do you think? We don't know. You know, I mean, her. well, she would be on dialysis, for sure. Yeah. Where the state of her health would be, I, I can't speculate, I don't know. But you know, the fact that she's a mom, I'm a single mom, and she's a mother of two, Um, You know, and she's married. She's got a great husband and her family's beautiful and fantastic. I'm so happy and just overjoyed that I could help all of them. I hate when people refer to like Tinder as like a hookup app because it's what you use it for. It's it's almost like when people say money is is evil. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's not. You could use it for evil. You can use it for bad things, but you can use it for good things too. Jen and I knew up front, like, you know, we were hoping to meet someone special, and clearly, clearly I did. Not only is she, you know, a complete stranger, she met Rich and went on a date once. How random is it that one swipe started this whole ball rolling and ended up with me having a new kidney and a new lease on life? I just, it's amazing. Last month, Rich, Jennifer, Erica, and her family, they all went out to dinner to celebrate what they call their kidneyversary. A year since the successful surgery. They hope to do this every year for many years to come. That's it for this week. Next week, it's my turn to play matchmaker. I'm taking over some Lucky Souls Tinder profiles and sending them out on dates. John Krasinski. John Krasinski? That's like my dream man in like more ways than I could tell you. Everyone's laughing in the studio right now. That should be pretty attainable. Come on. That is so easy. We will get you John (laughs) Krasinski in five minutes. Oh my God. Like a doofy white guy. That's next week on DTR. DTR is a branded podcast from Tinder, made in partnership with Gimlet Creative. This episode was produced by me, Jane Marie, along with Francis Harlow, Abby Ruzika, Nicole Long, Caitlin Boguki, and Grant Irving, with creative direction from Nazanin Rafsanjani. This episode was mixed and engineered by Zach Schmidt and Dan Gallucci. Thanks to RMW and Christine Driscoll. Special thanks to Indu Harikumar and Varun Nayar. And a very special thanks to Jaden Thomas for speaking with us about his mom, Jennifer. For more info on polycystic kidney disease and how you can become an organ donor, visit our website, dtrshow.com. DTR is on iTunes, Google Play, and wherever you listen to podcasts. 
If you like the show, subscribe and leave us a review telling us why. The reviews really help other people discover the show. I'm Jane Marie. Thanks for listening. What did you think when you first heard that this was maybe going to happen? I was thinking, this is going to be great. She's going to save a life. Really? That was your first thought? Mm Mm-hmm.